officers and representatives of CIRCA, CHED, the Head Foundation, and to our participants from member institutions of SUC ACAP, good morning to all of you. Thank you, CIRCA, for inviting me to be part of this leadership development program for higher education institutions in the Philippines. It is my honor to share with you today my thoughts on institutional or organizational resilience, especially for universities. What is institutional resilience? Or to put it otherwise, what does it take to be resilient? Resilience simply defined is the capacity to withstand adversity and to bounce back and grow despite difficult challenges. Australian pediatrician and human development expert, Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg, proposed seven interrelated components that make a person resilient. These are, number one, competence, or knowing how to handle stressful situations effectively. Number two, confidence, or belief in one's own abilities. Number three, connection, or close ties to family, friends, and community that give one a sense of security and belonging. Four, character, or a commitment to one's values and a strong sense of self-worth. Five, contribution, or the experience of having made the world a better place. Six, coping, or a set of skills that help one to overcome life's challenges such as stress management and social skills. And seven, control, or the knowledge that one has the ability to make his own decisions and to choose how to respond to any given situation. What about institutional resilience? Our UP Resilience Institute created to empower communities with information on effective climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, defines institutional resilience as, I quote, the capacity of an institution to absorb and recover without much adverse effect from any major disturbance or crisis such as natural and anthropogenic hazards, unquote. Just like humans and communities, institutions need bounce-back ability. But what is the difference between an institution that has this quality and an institution that can be considered fragile or vulnerable? In a January 2015 article on institutional resilience in extreme operating environments, management researchers from the HEC Montreal, McGill University, the University of Paris Dauphin, and the City University London noted that well-established institutions are resilient because they enforce regulative, normative, and cultural cognitive elements that may remain even after a disaster. Well-established institutions act as social facts that inform the actors within these institutions. These institutions, which include universities, continue to provide their actors with scripts, templates, and structures after major disturbance, thus preventing complete institutional collapse. As with individuals, these institutions supply their actors with the same components of resilience, such as skills that enable them to cope with the disruption, which in turn give them a sense of confidence in their ability to recover, a set of core values and principles, a degree of control over how to respond, and a sense of connection to the institution's cultural cognitive elements, including its vision, mission, its history, and its role and function in society. And while the researchers focused on cooperative banking in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, the same can be said of universities as well, comparing it 
say, the resilience of Wall Street after 9-11. Let's take the University of the Philippines. UP will be 113 years old this year. In those 113 years, our university has faced catastrophes and disasters, both natural and man-made. Not only has UP survived these disasters, it has thrived and emerged with renewed vigor and strength. UP has pulled through the ravages of World War II, devastation by super typhoons, and political and social turmoil, including the 20-year reign of a dictator. So I believe UP knows a little something about resilience. There is a saying among members of our community that UP, the National University, is a microcosm of the country itself. And we Filipinos are famous for our resilience. It enables us to endure natural disasters year after year, as well as the impacts of poverty and armed conflict. As a people, our strength, in part, lies in our ability to withstand adversity and bounce back from difficult events. Aside from this, UP is an institution that thrives on constant improvement. We consistently aim to improve upon our previous achievements. In recent years, we have seen the results of our persistence to do and be better than we were. In 2019, we broke into the world's top 500 universities among 1,396 research universities that were assessed and ranked in 2010 by the Times Higher Education World University Rankings. Last year, we were able to retain our top 500 position for the 2021 rankings despite the increased number of research universities that were assessed. Our highest score was in citations or global research influence, which accounted for 30% of our total score. We also ranked 69th among the top 634 higher education institutions in Asia in the 2021 Quacquarelli Simons Asia University rankings. In other words, we place in the top 10.3%. This is a steady climb since the 2018 edition where we were in the top 17.6%. In its 2021 global rankings, UP was number 369 in the top 1,000 of the 5,500 institutions that were assessed. Since the beginning of my term, my administration had already recognized the urgent need to modify UP's educational delivery systems so as to adapt to the changing education environment. The fourth industrial revolution has been transforming the global labor and sociocultural landscape, as well as the work and life skills that universities are expected to instill among their students, faculty, and staff. Considering the pervasiveness of digital technologies and in light of the continuing threat from natural disasters worsened by climate change that could force the suspension of classes, we knew we had to be flexible if we wanted to make sure our students still get the education they deserve. So we planned our transition toward blended learning. We mapped out how we would complement our traditional residential learning system with other modalities such as online learning. We set a timeline intending to carry out this transition by June 2020. We all know what happened next. In March 2020, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic and the country, like the rest of the world, was shut down. Waiting until mid-2020 to transition towards blended learning became impossible. All Philippine educational institutions, UP included, had to turn to full remote teaching and learning. Immediately, and while we in UP had been gearing ourselves to become a hybrid university that matched the realities of our time, even our best laid plans were swept away by this abrupt tidal shift. Most, if not all, HEIs around the world share this experience. We have been compelled by these unprecedented circumstances to act quickly and do what we had to do to ensure continued education delivery. 
The University of Queensland in Australia is a case in point. In the letter to me dated September 2020, University of Queensland's newly installed president and vice chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry, wrote, and I quote, This has been a challenging year for all of us, but this year has also given us an opportunity to challenge entrenched approaches and rethink how we deliver education so that graduates can thrive in a new industrial era." Unquote. Despite the dramatic changes in our lives caused by the pandemic, our vision remains unchanged that UP will be a university of the future. A UP of the future that remains relevant to society by being adaptive and forward-looking, guided by the principles of inclusivity, accessibility, and sustainability. A UP that continues to be resilient in the face of adversity, challenge, and crisis. Today, our institution's resilience is once again being challenged. And as with the disruptions we have faced before, we absorbed the shock and sought to regain our footing. Now we have turned firmly towards not only surviving this pandemic, but emerging into the next normal of the post-COVID era with renewed vigor and strength, just as we have done in the past 113 years. My team and I uh, were aware that any massive transformation, such as the sudden shift from the traditional classroom education to a fully remote teaching and learning, could not possibly be done successfully in such a short amount of time. To do this, financial resources and infrastructure should have been fully in place and with people already trained in the new systems even before their implementation. But we had no choice. We did the best we could with the resources we had at the time. We gave our faculty five days, merely five days, to assess their students' capacity for online access. For three weeks, our faculty members worked to adjust their syllabi and familiarize themselves with alternative platforms for remote teaching and learning. UP is very fortunate because we have our open university to look to for experience and best practices in distance education. In response to the pandemic, the UPOU released massive open online courses to help faculty and academic institutions make a quick shift to a new education delivery. Following the declaration of enhanced community quarantine back in March 2020, we decided to suspend classes across the UP system except for the UPOU. The risk of infection was too high and the lockdown had also increased the levels of anxiety and stress among members of the UP community. Survival was our paramount concern and compassion meant striking a balance between our roles to deliver education and to ensure the physical, mental, and psychological well-being of our community. We recalibrated our strategies moving forward with guidance from the UPOU. So for the second semester of academic year 2019-2020, we lifted academic deadlines, terminated the semester early, adjusted succeeding academic calendars, and implemented a deferred grading scheme to allow our students another year to complete their academic requirements. During our mid-year term, we released our academic plan for the coming academic year 2020-2021. The new plan was guided by three operational principles. First, protect our UP community from the pandemic. Second, sustain the continuity of instruction and learning. And third, consider equity concerns in all the plans. We also launched the Kaagapay sa Pag-aaral ng Scholar ng Bayan fundraising campaign, which aims to support our almost 6,000 students who are at risk of dropping out because they had no means to continue their studies via remote learning. 
The Kaagapay campaign was intended to help provide them with the gadgets and connectivity they needed and to give them hope in knowing that there are people willing to share their burden and ease their struggles. And so when academic year 2020-2021 rolled in last September, we were at least better prepared. We had instituted programs and made necessary upgrades to improve our academic environment according to our academic plan. And as always, we kept our goal transforming UP into a university of the future. Here are some concrete steps we took to enhance our capabilities to meet the challenges of the times. We subscribe to a Zoom account for webinars that can accommodate up to 3,000 participants. We purchase Canvas, a learning management system, as we continue to upgrade our own learning management system. We also acquired software to support remote work, teaching and learning. We procured additional library resource subscriptions, which we continually seek to increase. We deployed Open Athens, and we have two other major library information systems, namely Tuklas, our discovery service platform launched in July last year. This is for UP Diliman that will soon integrate the local databases of the other UP constituent universities. And second, OneLib, our union catalog of library holdings in all UP units across the country. At the core of this educational shift is our TVUP, which produces open educational resources and which transforms all these course packs into the digital format. Apart from the Kaagapay fundraising campaign for students, we have been providing gadgets and connectivity support to our faculty and staff. We incentivized the creation of course packs by our faculty. These course packs are available online and offline, with physical course packs produced and delivered to students via courier or through our campuses at no cost to our students. In addition, in January, we started the distribution of UP-funded learning assistance grants that consist of gadgets and connectivity requirements. We recognize the critical need to support the mental and emotional health of our students, faculty, and staff during this difficult time. To do this, we created a mental health and wellness network across the UP system. This network provides psychosocial support and services and facilitates referrals for treatment and other interventions. A training program on mental health promotion in the teaching learning environment for college mental health focal persons has been ongoing since March. These efforts did not guarantee a smooth transition and we never expected them to. Moreover, it was clear that the pandemic on top of the back-to-back -back typhoons that hit the country in the latter part of 2020 was taking a toll on the UP community. In a survey conducted between November 9 and December 6 last year, we found that with the exception of UPOU students and faculty, majority of UP students and faculty members felt overwhelmed in completing course requirements and in conducting course online, respectively. This was unsurprising given the in-person class experience they were used to. Many of the students reported negative experiences with remote teaching and learning, while the faculty had a more positive response. Taking all this into consideration, it was decided that the most humane thing to do for our students was to implement an equitable and fair grading system where students would not be forced drop, nor would they be given conditional failing grades. A grade of incomplete would suffice, and students would have a year to complete their course requirements. Alongside all this, we are also making sure that UP is doing all that it can to help our people survive the pandemic. Leading the charge are UP Manila, the National Health Sciences Center, and the UP Philippine General Hospital, 
one of the largest public hospitals in the country. The UPPGH and the College of Medicine in UP Manila have a long history of heroism and resilience. The College of Medicine was the only UP unit that remained open and functional during the Second World War. The doctors, nurses, and staff of PGH kept the hospital running throughout those dark years, braving sniper fire and the bombings that traced the city of Manila to the ground. In 2020, faced again with an impending war, this time against a novel coronavirus and disease we knew little of, UP Manila and the PGH again answered the call. The PGH was appointed as a primary COVID-19 referral center by the government. The hospital and its staff have continued to fulfill their duty since then. Even after its third floor was hit by a fire in mid-May of this year. In addition, the UP Manila National Institutes of Health was designated as a testing center while the UPPGH Bayanihan Na COVID-19 Operations Center was established to provide a 24 by 7 hotline for patient queries about COVID. UP Manila, the UP College of Medicine, and the UPPGH are also sharing as much of their knowledge, expertise, and experience in treating and managing COVID-19 through the weekly Stop COVID Deaths webinar. This is a webinar series which is available to the public via YouTube. And I understand this is produced by our own TVUP. However, UP Manila and the UPPGH are not in this alone. The UP community from north to south also heeded the call to serve the country. Our research institutes continue to provide vital services to our medical frontliners, to local and national government, and to the public at large. Just to name a few examples, the Philippine Genome Center and the UP Manila National Institutes of Health produced in early 2020 the Gen Amplify COVID-19 Detection Kit. By the way, the Philippine Genome Center is part of the UP system. The scientists in these two institutions also work to detect and track the different COVID-19 variants spreading throughout the country through genomic biosurveillance. The UPPGs is two satellite facilities based in UP Visayas and UP Mindanao train local health professionals in PCR testing and help set up laboratories in their regions. The UP Resilience Institute and the UP COVID-19 Pandemic Response Team created a multilingual artificial intelligence chatbot to answer questions from the public related to COVID-19 and a policy source book to help Filipinos make sense of their local government's issuances about COVID-19. UP units tap into their own fields of expertise come up with resources to aid in the battle against COVID-19. For instance, the UP Diliman College of Engineering and fabrication labs in UP Diliman and UP Cebu produced sanitation tents and disinfection facilities. They also 3D printed face shields for frontliners. Constituents of the UP Diliman College of Science volunteered to help in the testing for the COVID-19 and to train medical technicians in the detection of the virus. UP's mathematicians and statisticians created models to map out the spread of the disease. UP scientists and researchers produce science-based policy papers to guide the actions of hospitals, local governments, and the national government. UP social scientists, educators, and mental health experts shared their knowledge in free webinars and offered safe spaces to struggling members of the UP community and the public. UP artists, writers, musicians, and performing groups created works that helped articulate the struggles of our people during this confusing and often frightening times. Each UP constituent university came up with COVID-19 task forces to ensure the safety and well-being of even their extended communities. UP Baguio, for instance, hosts an arts and crafts fair 
in an open area on its campus where local artists and artisans who have lost their livelihood to the pandemic may sell their artworks. UP Baguio staff even made sure the campus stray cats are cared for while the campus remains largely empty. Lupi Los Baños, where CMU Circa is based, has been exemplary in its care for its academic and extended community. It opened the COVID-19 Molecular Diagnostics Laboratory to serve as a COVID-19 testing center for Laguna and nearby provinces and has recently offered its Copeland Gymnasium as a COVID-19 vaccination center for the UP community and the nearby municipalities. This is similar to the vaccination site set up in UP's Diliman College of Human Kinetics. Just recently, the UP Board of Regents approved the UPLB's creation of a new research program on zoonotic diseases. This program will tap experts from multiple disciplines to study the jumping of animal diseases to humans and how to prevent it. The new coronavirus is an example of a virus that jumped from animals to humans. Even our alumni continue to give their all to serve the people. Allow me to name just one who has become well known recently. Ms. Anna Patricia Non, the entrepreneur who started the first community pantry in Maginhawa Street, inspired many other such pantries across the country. She is a UP Fine Arts graduate. Believe me, there are many, many others like her, and UP alumni chapters are working quietly to support our students and faculty, their communities, and their country. The Honorable Dr. Natarajan Faraprasad posed this question, and I quote, What does resilience mean to a university leader? Is it the leader's own capacity to change and adapt? Or can it be built into the whole system? What do we need to do? What do we need to invest in? And what training do we need to build this resilience? Unquote. For us who are in leadership positions in our institutions, being in the driver's seat right now may feel like an intolerable ordeal. We have been cast into the unknown, all too conscious of the weight of the responsibility to guide and reassure those in our care. Flexibility, adaptability, resourcefulness, and persistence. These qualities have never been more essential for a university leader along with irrational amounts of hope. But while a university leader provides the necessary direction, I believe that resilience must be built into the system because the university will, and indeed, should last longer than any rector or president. After all, isn't this the mark of our success as leaders? To leave behind an institution that is better and stronger than before? This is the case for us in UP. The shift came far sooner than we were prepared for, and many of us are struggling with fear and anxiety made worse by the isolation forced upon us. Those of us who serve at the front lines of this battle continue to do so while carrying immense psychological burdens. A pandemic like a war is a cataclysmic event. None of us will truly escape unscathed. But I believe that UP's institutional resilience remains as strong as ever. Why? Because of our strengths. Our core competencies is one of these strengths. This includes a university's unmatched capacity to analyze situations and plot out potential future tracks based on sound research outputs and insights from a multitude of disciplines. For all the new technologies, new ways of learning and teaching, new ways of doing and thinking, we in the university remain confident in our ability to cope and to adapt. This confidence is also our strength. UP is a community, but it is a very large, diverse community with smaller communities nested within it. 
and porous borders that make room for other communities to hug it from the outside. We are so large that we often run the risk of losing track of members of our community. But I made it our top priority to reach out to as many as possible, to never leave anyone behind. This is precisely the motivation behind our Kaagapay fundraising campaign, behind our mental health and wellness network, and behind our measures to make suitable work from home arrangements for our administrative staff. As diverse as our community is, we in UP share a set of common values and principles. Our mandate as the national university and our commitment to the nation remain constant. Our principles guide and inspire our teaching, our research, our public service, our professional work, and ultimately, our contribution to society. What are these principles? Honor and excellence. Honor and excellence in the service of the Filipino people. By holding on to these principles, we become more capable of coping with the changing circumstances, more willing to learn the things we need to learn, and more capable of making informed decisions and crafting the best possible responses to any situation. These, more than anything else, are UP's strengths. Transforming UP for the next normal. During the Temasek Foundation NUS 2021 Summit, on University Management for Southeast Asian Leaders, I spoke during the President's Roundtable. My short remarks on my top priority as President was to protect the UP community from the virus, sustain the continuity of education, and make a successful transformation to a new educational system the shortest time possible. Beyond that, as we go forward into the brave new next normal, my top priority is a system change toward independent learning, which will be more resilient and accommodating of the varied circumstances and unique needs of both learner and teacher. Independent and lifelong learning will be key to the future. Therefore, we are moving to create a new educational delivery system in our universities that would foster this. This new system will be unlike the traditional classroom style education of before and will not merely be grafting of in-person class lectures onto online media. This entails a reorientation, a paradigm shift among our faculty, students, administrators, and staff. This will require awareness flexibility and inclusivity as we take into consideration the connectivity capabilities of our students, faculty, and staff, as well as the other burdens that have been imposed upon them by this pandemic. But beyond the pandemic, are we ready? As I said at the President's Roundtable, I would like to think we are. I do not see UP life returning to the pre-pandemic days, but it won't be like what we have now as well. We are taking the best of our academic traditions from the last 113 years, before and during COVID-19, to navigate the next normal of our lives. The UP of the future is a university that takes on the tasks of educating people, of creating knowledge, and producing innovations through research, and of engaging with society with a clear-eyed view of the needs and realities of the 21st century. The UP of the future is a university that will make sure that its students, graduates, faculty, staff, and all members of its community are equipped with 21st century skills, an unquenchable thirst for lifelong learning, and a willingness to serve the greater good. The first step to achieving this vision is to believe in the resilience that has taken UP this far. And this is more than enough reason for me to be hopeful for the future. Thank you very much.